Hey everyone in the street questions with Brad Lands. Hey everybody. Returning guest. Good to be back. Guest. All right. I'm excited to have Brad back on the podcast. And it's funny because the last time we talked about him actually starting to write a book and here we are. Actually, Brad has finished his book. So give him a little, give him a little shout out <laughs> there too. Love and that. Hey, thanks, man. Brad, thanks for, congratulations, first of all, because it is very Thank hard you. to write a book, stick with it. Lots of times we have a grand vision of things that we want to do, but actually getting them done is a totally different thing. And books are like the, are like running a marathon, but of knowledge, right? Like it's that process, right? It's not yeah, a that's good book. analogy. Yeah. So it, to stick with it. And, and uh, so I'm, I appreciate that you're coming on the podcast to talk about it so before we even get into it. And before I get into anything, I'm really, this is one of my new year's resolutions. It's probably my only new year's resolution. I ask you, please like the video and hit subscribe because I don't ever say that. And then nobody subscribes. And then I don't think anybody is watching and then it's sad. So people should know what to do by now. Right? Well, you would think? I think if you say it, maybe who knows, <laughs> but we're going to actually have a little giveaway too. And we're going to ask you to either comment or post on Twitter. So we'll ask that in a second, but before we get into anything, I'm going to ask you three questions about the book. But the first question is tell us the title of the book and just give us a little short overview of what it's about. Great. So the title of the book is called Knowledge Able, and it's trying to take the approach of teaching kids to be knowledgeable, right? Where the teacher has all the information using textbooks that are outdated and having the teacher just impart information to students is totally outdated and not really representative of the world we live in now. And so I try to make that shift where I title it Knowledge Able to try to do something differently, to think about it in 180 degrees. So instead of teaching students the information that they need to know that they will then later be tested on, thinking about it in terms of focusing more on the skills that they need to become independent lifelong learners. Because if we double down on the learning process and specifically teach students particular skills that will help them to become better learners, they will be able to learn anything that they desire. It's like the analogy of give a man a fish, he eats for a day, but teach a man a fish, he eats for a lifetime. That type of thing, shifting the thinking on that. Yeah, and that, that to me, like one of the questions I get all the time is, and because of the work that I do and what I've written in the past, what do you see as the next big change in education? I'm like, I have no idea and neither do you, right? Right. So, and even if, if you look at, nobody is predicting chat GPT, right? Not like there people were talking about AI, but they weren't, nobody was like envisioning what this would be. And all of a sudden it's here and immediately what's happening. And I saw this uh, one of my friends, like literally the second they came back off break, the first thing they see is it's blocked. Right. Yep. And it's, it's like, it's blocked from the school. Do not use this. And so what I always, when I answer what's the next thing, I always say, I don't know. And neither do you. What right. I do know is that whatever comes our way, we have to be able to figure it out and we have to teach our kids to be able to figure it out too. 100%. So I that, that, that I, that's why I'm really excited about the process of the book. And so here is the contest and Brad has so kindly agreed and Brad self-published this book, right? Like you did this. Yes, I own, did. Right? Thank this you. Is, yeah. This is, so I'm really encouraging you to get the book. Um, and even if you win, you should get it still. But I'm going to encourage you. Here's one thing. We're going to have a little contest here. So if you're listening on YouTube right now, if you're listening on any podcast, if you use the hashtag knowledge underscore able, Correct. and we am going to give you a week after the release of this podcast. So we haven't decided when the podcast is coming out. So if you do that within a week, uh, just share one thing that you're doing that kind of lines with what Brad's talking about in your school, in your classroom, in your leadership practice. You can read you can win a copy of knowledge underscore able. And if you don't use Twitter, don't use any social media, then just comment on the YouTube video. And so Brad's going to be keeping an eye on that. I'll give him an alert to it too. He probably doesn't read my comments on my YouTube. I always read my comments, right? Because I get two of them a video. (laughs) I'll be paying attention to this episode for sure. All right. right. Yeah. So just check it out. And so just use that hashtag or your comment down below and you will get, will you sign it? Will you do that? Of course. It'll be a signed copy. Sign yeah. copy, right? So yeah, it, sign copy. Awesome. So I appreciate you actually doing that. One of the questions I want to ask you is, you you did this yourself, right? 
And yeah. you actually, this is a book you self published. And so what was that process like? Because I think a lot of times, and that's one of the beauties of our world right now is that if you want to publish a book, you don't need permission, right? If you want to become an artist, you don't need to be approved to be in someone else's gallery. You can just yeah. do it yourself. Like whether it's on Instagram, YouTube, you can do that. And you can actually build your own spaces, your own audience and things like that too. So like, how was that process of self-publishing? So I wasn't sure if I was going to self-publish at first. All I knew was that I wanted to write this book. I've had this idea for like seven or eight years now. I had done keynote speeches on it. I've written blog posts about it. And so I really wanted to form it into a book to be able to share and publish with the world. And so I didn't know what approach I was going to take to publishing. I, I searched around and talked to different people and different colleagues who I knew that published and went the traditional route and also went self-publishing. And I feel like my idea for my book, when I made some different pitches, it didn't really fit into any particular mold that I think some traditional publishing companies wanted to see. And so I got a little discouraged thinking that some different publishing companies weren't really excited about my content or they didn't really think that it was going to mesh well with their ideals, right, or their model. And so I decided halfway through writing the book that I was just going to self-publish. And I was really excited about making that idea because I knew that I was going to learn so much more about the process. I knew it was going to take a lot more work and a lot more time and energy, but I was really excited to learn the ins and outs and every fine de detail about the entire writing and publishing process. And so when I decided that I was going to self-publish, I started researching, talking to more of my friends and colleagues that had self-published had conversations with them online. And I found out that it could be a good strategy to publish under an LLC. So what I did was I ended up creating my own LLC called Uplearn LLC, and I self-published under that LLC. And the reason I did that was for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to be able to market myself a little bit differently and all the consulting work that I've been doing for a long time, I could really market that and, and put it into a separate category of the fun, innovative technology and instructional design that I do with my consulting, and then also have that be on the publishing side. So I could also choose to separate everything a little bit if I wanted to. And I also think that it makes it look a little bit more professional, being able to have an LLC, even though it's still me, having an LLC do the publishing part of it and being able to document that. And so it was a really good tip that I found and decided I wanted to do it. And so I'm really glad I ran with it. And now I'm doing my own consulting thing on the side, being able to do presentations and workshops and having that all funnel um, through my Uplearn LLC, which I use to be able to publish my book. And it was great. Just I learned so much from talking to so many different people about the process and weighing in about what they did and how they chose how to they do, chose it and, do it. And, and uh, pretty much where they wanted to sell it. And after talking to a lot of different people, I chose to specifically just sell it on Amazon. I didn't think I would be interested in having it in bookstores. It required a lot of additional work and different strategies that had to go with that. So I decided to just do everything right through Amazon. And I'm really excited with the choices I made. Now I'm just excited to hear back from people about the book. I can't wait to hear how it lands on others any takeaways that they might have, lessons that I share. And I'm just excited to have conversations about it with people. Yeah, and I'm sure like in, if you, we'll have Brad's Twitter down below, so you can tag him. So if you ever have questions on this, it seems like Brad's the expert now, he went through the process, right? And that's I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I did expertise. learn a lot. You have yeah. some expertise, you might I, have I do, expertise, right? <laughs> for sure. This is something that I think is really valuable as a, as an educator too, because a lot of times when we, we talk about how we're preparing kids for jobs that don't exist. Right. And that's a conversation that happens in education. And I'm like, why aren't we preparing kids to create their own pathway? Like, why aren't we yeah. actually helping kids become employers, not just employees? Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. You're always, we're always talking about them going to work for someone else as yeah. opposed to, Hey, a lot of these kids are figuring this stuff out on their own and saying, I don't need to, work for anyone else. I can find my passion here, do this element. And so there, there is a little bit of a, uh, there is a risk in always betting on yourself, but there is also, uh, an ownership over the process as well. Right. And so you, you, 
I think you get as much success as you're willing to create for yourself. Right. So yeah. you didn't do any of the work. If it took forever, you weren't willing to share and get on people's podcasts and do those things. The book's not going to do as well. Right. But right. now, so it's, now it's on that process. So I think it's a really, I think it really beautifully ties into the theme of your book, right? Like that, right. It yeah. is kind of a process that you went through to do this. Yeah. And I actually talk about it in the book several times. The book is actually a little bit meta where I pause and talk about the book writing process for me trying to become more knowledge able as an independent lifelong learner and point out specific points in my journey to be able to use as different strategies and, and takeaways that teachers and students can hopefully use and apply. It's like a eighties, like John Hughes movie where you know, <laughs> yeah. they turn and talk that's a good to way to think about it. Right. Yeah, the yeah. camera, the Ferris Bueller moment where they're talking right to you. Right. That's kind of when you said that, I was like, is that kind of like that? That'd be kind of yeah. kind of interesting to see. Okay, so you talked about strategies, right? So a lot of people can talk about this stuff, but what is a a strategy of that you maybe share in the book um, that you talk about to help develop this? And don't, don't give them all away, right? Because we want no, no, not at all. So what what's one strategy that you talk about in the book, and how can it help teachers? I would say the biggest strategy that I use in the book is something that we talked about on the previous episode. It's called the ABLE cycle. And so I use the word knowledge ABLE and highlight the word ABLE as an acronym to go through the process of learning. And so I start with A, ask a question, B, believe in yourself, L, leverage resources, and E, execute the task. And parts three and four really talk about the able cycle and it breaks it down and how you can have individual strategies within each of those acronym letters to paint a broader picture and to give you more tools and resources that you can be able to use and apply this able cycle and in part four i actually share a knowledge able action plan and i ask you to think about something that you might want to learn that you're that you haven't mastered yet or if you want to try to take a a takeaway from this book and really try to implement it I offer this knowledge able action plan, this personalized action plan that you can use in order to try to learn something new for yourself or to try to have your students use it. And so the first two parts are a little bit different. The first part focuses on the why we need a knowledge able classroom these days. It really makes the case for a knowledge able classroom. And then the second part illuminates the conditions that amplify learning. And so I call teachers these days learning conditioners. So that teachers can actually try to provide as best as they can the conditions that are optimal for student learning. And while there are certain staples of conditions that generally work best for everyone, we still need to differentiate that based on students' individual needs. And so, again, the first part focuses on the why. The second part focuses on the what. The third part focuses on the how. And then the fourth part focuses on the what now. Love it. Love it. And so here's, and this is the last thing I'm going to ask you about. Yeah. When I'm recording this, just probably about a month and a half ago, ChatGPT was everywhere. And, yep. and I think, and I don't know it, like where it was. Maybe it wrote the book for you. Who knows, right? Maybe that's what I thought. <laughs> we'll never know, will we? We'll never know, right? And one of the things that I've started to do is I've actually started to utilize it in my own learning to figure it out from the viewpoint of a learner. So then I could give effective strategies to talk about teaching. What I'm watching is a lot of people saying, here's a project, here's a thing. And I'm like, how did you, how do you know that? How do you know this, right? And I think a lot of times we jump straight to the teaching without doing the learning. For example, mm. I wrote a blog post yesterday and I, I talked about the book, The Four Agreements. Now I read the entire book and I, I, I read the entire book and, but then I actually said, and so I asked chat GPT to summarize what the four agreements are and provide me a quote. So I, I actually do. say that in my blog post and it's bang on. Right. And then I use it just like, I would say, this is from Wikipedia. This is from this website. I just said, this is from chat GPT. So I, I didn't pretend something else. Right. But, but then I actually took my own context and, and then shared things that chat GPT wouldn't know. Cause they're not George stories. Right. Like I can't say tell George Crow stories. So right. like, how did I actually take my learning from and combine it as opposed to replace it, right? And I think that's what's gonna separate what we do in education with this 
Is it something that chat GPT could, is it an assignment that chat GPT could just answer for you? Or is it something that we could utilize it, but you still have to get that real human element, that real that empathetic sure. story. Yeah. So how do you see the chat GPT and its use, the connection to what you talk about in your book? That's a great question. And so one of my chapters, it's called relationships versus robots. Right. And I talk about the importance of relationships as teachers, as the human element, and also talk about the importance of technology and its role in education as well. I point out that there are advantages and pros and cons to both. And if there really is a foreseeable future where robots or computers could overtake teachers. And so at the end of the chapter, giveaway, spoiler alert, I talk about shifting that question to think about rather than relationships versus robots, how can we think of it as relationships with robots, right? Mm -hmm. Technology is so ubiquitous and accessible these days that we have to use it in order to use our learning to amplify it and make it better, right? And so how can we have those relationships with technology so that we can use it in more powerful ways to really help to accelerate our learning as opposed to not using it, right? And so there's always something that will be the next best thing that comes along that really pauses us and really makes us question technology use, right? Before it was the pen, this will be permanent, we won't be able to erase right. it, right? Jumping all the way to now. We can't foresee what these next technological advances will be, but I think we have to have the attitude and the approach to learning with it and thinking about how we can use it to promote good in the world and mm -hmm. what should we be cautious about in terms of potential downfalls that it could create? If we have those attitudes, I think it'll be really helpful for us to navigate some of these really difficult decisions that schools face about whether or not to include it, whether or not to block it, or should we just put more energy into working with students to teach them to make better digital decisions when using these types of technologies? Yeah. Like when you're talking about this, uh, the the analogy that I think about, and I don't know if you remember, remember Khan Academy, right? I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah. I'll use it, right? So when Khan Academy first came out, it's a great example. Like, oh, oh, my God. Like, this is going to, we're going to become, some people were like terrified this is going to replace teachers. I never had that concern ever. Right. And I, my argument was like, if you, if that's the way you teach, <laughs> then you're in trouble. Yeah. But I, I don't teach like that. There is an element of that. And so was there a benefit in Cod Academy? And I'm sure people still use it as a supplemental re resource. Exactly. Of yep. course it is, right? And that's the same way I'm looking at ChatGPT. It's not a replacement, but unless we act in the way that we would use it as a replacement. So how do you make that a supplemental resource versus this? Because I, I was never, there was not one day where I was worried that Khan Academy was going to replace what I was doing just the right. same way. I'm not worried about chat GPT, but I am going to use those things and I'm going For to sure. see the benefit of it, and I'm going to take, I'm going to leverage them to do things that actually, I know this sounds weird that actually need less thinking, right? Like how yeah. am I going to use those things that do less thinking automation. Yeah. yeah. So I love that. I love that analogy. I appreciate you bringing that up. Everyone. I really appreciate you listening to the podcast, Brad. Again, congratulations. I know it's a Thank a you, George. Process. It's good to see you again. So you can actually see a link to Brad's book down in, in the description down below. Remember, subscribe. We'd love your comments so you can win a copy, your own signed copy. That's right. Signed copy. Knowledge able. So check it out. Again, Brad, congratulations. Everyone, thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day.